a lot of you are really new friends, um, so it means a ton that you came out for this. You've probably been hearing me talk about it for weeks now, um, and it's just really meaningful to me to actually be able to share uh, this book with you. Um, I'm going to be reading tonight from Four Reincarnations, which is the first book from poet Max Ritvo, um from Milkweed Editions. Um, Max, if you don't know, was a dear friend of mine from college. We met in 2009. Um, he was the first person that I ever met at Yale because we had a um, like a kind of mentor kind of thing called Big Sibs, and we had the same person that was supposed to like lead us through the trials of freshman year. Um, and so we started Facebook chatting, because um, that was what you did in 2009. And very quickly, I learned, through looking at his pictures, that this was a person like, oh my god, I never met before in my life. I saw these really strange photos of him taken through like the iPhoto thing, where he was totally bald, like no hair on his face, and has drawn in like different eyebrows and like little hairs, and like wearing berets with his stuffed animals, and like acting out different scenes. And like there was one where his, his uh, girlfriend at the time was holding him, like the Pieta, and he was like dead in her arms, like wearing like a white sheet, like a thing thrown over his mention unmentionables, mentionables? <laughs> no, no, I'm mentioning them. Um, so uh, I was like, who are you? Um, what is going on? And I learned uh, not long thereafter that when he was 15, he had been diagnosed with Ewing sarcoma, which is a kind of rare form of pediatric cancer, and had gone through uh, treatment and was now in remission and was going on to finish his education, or start his education at Yale. Um, and we be became friends because he, like said the word lacuna in our chat, which was weird for us, like a 17-year-old person. I thought he was talking about the Trojan priest Loakawam and like being the like really over-eager, like like uh, new college students that I was. I was like, let me tell you the whole story of the Trojan War in like a Facebook chat, and I like, went this like long thing. Of course, he knew this all because he's one of the smartest people I ever met and like knew all this stuff and listened so patiently. I like told him of like the horse and like the serpent thing. Like, um, so we uh, we became friends really quickly after that um, and remained friends all through college and in the years after. Um, his senior year of college, he was re-diagnosed and unfortunately passed away on August 23rd. Um, so the first day that I started school here. So it's been a kind of a weird adjustment that a lot of you have, have been with me through. So I thank you for that. Um, and luckily this book got a publisher, someone that saw it for the truly remarkable artistic accomplishment that it is, and it lives, and it's beautiful, and I'm really looking forward to sharing it with you today. Um, so I'm going to read a few poems from it, um, and then at the end I might read a little thing that I wrote for him if I'm feeling it. Um, so yeah, we're just going to get started. I have this like, weird urge to be like, any questions? What are you talking about? Oh, actually, you know what I do want to read first? Okay, so his blurbs are insane. Um, he, he's just like, has some pretty like, impressive people. Um, and one of them was, uh, he somehow got in contact with Tom Waits. Because um, that's like the kind of magical thing that he was capable of. Um, who's one of his and one of my favorite musical artists. Who wrote, read his poetry and thought it was just like amazing. So he blurbed his book. Um, and he wrote him this poem, which is so cute. Uh, it goes, a Max Rebo poem is, a map drawn by hand to show where the body is buried. A card trick with words. Don't show me how you did it. Like reading the last sentence in a book first. Dragging words across the page like a bow across a string. A piece of candy covered with ants. Like silverfish ate the words off a page and left you a riddle. All of the above. <laughs> I thought it was really cute. Um, so yeah, I'm going to get started uh, with the first, book, the first poem in this book. Um, I'm going to try to honor the order as much as possible. I've done like a little bit of changing, but I saw him like with sheets on the floor for hours and hours, so I want to kind of try to like keep, keep that in, um, uh, intact. So this poem is called Living It Up. The bed is on fire, and are you laughing? You leave the bed and leave me without thought. The springs want to embrace each other, but they're afraid if they break their spiral, they will never be able to hold anyone. I wish you would let me know how difficult it is to love me. Then I would know you love me beneath all that difficulty. You are tending not only to me, you tell me, but to your other child, the heir. And air puts his feet in my slippers, and air scrubs his teeth on my brush. And we must learn to share a bed. We must learn to share a body. The money is running out. 
We will have to split one needle this winter. One end for me, one end for air. Um, I've seen Max read so many times in so many um, incredible, peculiar situations. Um, one time he, see he won this Poetry Society of America chapbook contest, which was pretty cool. And uh, there were too many people for the, the auditorium, so people sat on the stage. It's like a small theater in New York. And because people were behind him, he didn't want anyone to feel left out, so he read a lot of the poems just like circling the whole night, like in a kimono. Um, so that was the kind of thing that he would do. Um, and I once saw someone introduce him, um, and he looked at them and he said, thank you, I feel like a person again. And I was like, whoa. Um, so he's definitely like a, a presence in the way that he reads. I'm gonna try to do it a little bit of justice, but it's super hard. Um, this poem is called The Senses. Everything feels so good to me. My wool hat, the cocoon of, my, of dryness in my throat. The sound of burning vegetables is like a quiet, clean man holding sheets. But I keep having thoughts, this thought always holding at bay the next thought until it sours into yet another picture of dissatisfaction that loves to be thought. Another pair, ugly as the head of a man who is thinking. I thought my next thought would be a vision of my suffering. I thought I would understand the yellow lightning in a painted storm, the crucial way it disappears when I imagine myself flung headlong into the painting. Instead, I have this picture of dissatisfaction, the thought not rising, but splitting in half on the unanswered question of lightning. My mind, like a black glove, you mistake for a man in the middle of a blizzard. Um, the next two poems I'm gonna read are for Max's really good friend, Melissa Carroll, um, who was a painter um, and also shared his same kind of cancer. Um, and the chapbook that he wrote for her aeons um, was, was for her, and um, so some of these poems are dedicated to her and um, he loved her very dearly and I feel very important to like bring her into the room right now. Um, so this poem is from Melissa Carroll um, and it's called The Watercolor Eulogy. When you leave my mind, the last piece of you to leave is your hands. When you go to the earth, the last part of you visible above what is either sand or clay isn't a hand but a glowing shroud. The black goose with your name in its throat and my name in its stomach will cough you up with her hoots. Part jelly, part watch, part bone, part me, part power. There is a dead language buried in English. There is a word no one remembers for a temple with a bowl of millet sealed in each brick. When you are buried, the word will grow a soft sound. Its meaning will change to specify you as the builder. No one can speak the language you will rewrite. I know this isn't the heaven we wanted, whatever is. And soon I'll join you amid the terms for tiny bottles of defunct potions and no longer understood passions, and together we'll bury our own particular I love you. I wouldn't mind its being sealed off with us in our brick of earth. This is called, Hi, Melissa. I have spoken to you of heaven. I simply meant the eyes are suns that see. Seeing is the face's nervous, delicious Lord. Listening to you makes me naked. When I kiss your ankle, I am silencing an oracle. The oracle speaks from the hill of your ankle. Um, the next couple poems are um, Maybe we need a little backstory. Um, Max has a rival, is how he describes it, uh, which I think is very important for all writers to have. Um, his rival <laughs> is a real person um, who uh, is a was a friend of his um, who is brilliant and effusive and super Jewish, much, much like Max. And they uh, had a lot of things in common, but this guy wasn't sick, um, so he cre he became this sort of like weird, bizarro, alternate version of Max that featured in a lot of his poems um, as Randall. That is what he named him, that is how he appears. Um, this poem is called To Randall, Crow Stealer, Lord of the Greenhouse, 
Uh, Crow is how Max's ex-girlfriend appears in his poems, and Crow and Randall are together now. So Randall, the crow stealer, towards the greenhouse. Um, this is a conversation at some point between the two of them, so I'm going to be like this, and that's Randall speaking. And then Max is going to be like, what? And that's how it's going to go, and that happens. I'm not, oh, to Randall Crow Stealer, Lord of the Greenhouse. I master the technology to make bricks. I build altars clumped with fire. I'm not afraid to light a flower and destroy her beauty. The crispy flower has been taken to a godly feast. Do you pity my imagination? It will kill you. My mother is my imagination. She will kill you. <laughs> I am a leather horse and my mother is riding me. You are a man, alert, passionate. You sit in an almond of glossy hair. You are capable of being persuaded by fine argument. You even smile eagerly when convinced. Remember what a great time we had in the first stanza? And now this, me blubbering, <laughs> me blubbering to mommy over your brilliance. Tell me what it's like to be you. Well, Max, imagine if you stayed by your bricks after your sacrifice until your body warmed them. It's called being indoors, and it's a good first step. I die of thirst! Imagine prying fingers through the bricks, making tunnels your mind first saw as ghosts. Imagine pressing your lips to the pipes and sipping dew from the outside. You are exquisitely sensitive. I imagine defecating over your eyebrows. A unibrow. And what about my godly flower? You still haven't accounted for that. I inhale the flower's smoke, and it allows me to control every inch of my body and a little man emerges. This is called being possessed. I dance out here, trouserless on the salt flat, dazzled by hail, because every gesture perfects my body into the little man's happy home. You have no flowers in your indoor dark, fireless Randall. Max, I have invented glass through which the sun may light my flowers. One of these days, you'll be stable enough to make a woman happy, and that will go a long way. The secret to making people happy, Randall, I call it your departing shiny suit, is that I am the people. <laughs> um, and this one is called Sky Sex Dreams of Randall. I am raving at you with extremely good eye contact. I fancy lovely that there are many drains to circle. Look at me and bore me, bore me good and flaccid. That's right, now I'm in a getup dressed like a palm tree lady, pull a skirt the whole shebang. I have reached the end of suffering and sat on the dark porch. On the white ledge, a spider throws up the fat of a bee. Three white wood chairs in the mud, a glass top table sealed into a knot of pampas grass. The chairs watching shadows on the glass top like white poodles, all named handsome, from different phases of your life. Watching television pictures of your sex dreams play out. Sob, elf, yelp, gnome of the end. And uh, this next poem uh, is called When I Criticize You, I'm Just Trying to Criticize the Universe. Um, <laughs> and Max's exes feature in his poems, as well as his wife, who's this amazing woman in Victoria that I love very, very much. Um, in his dedication, he, his dedication is actually pretty cute. It's to my master, to my wife, to my mother, to my fathers, to my sisters, to my nephew, to my teachers, to my friends, to my exes, to my shrinks, and to my doctors. And he, like all of those people are in here, and he means that, like that love for each of them, like very, very truly. Um, so this is a bit of a Three's Company poem with two of his ex-girlfriends and his wife in it. <laughs> when I criticize you, I'm just trying to criticize the universe. Why do you shit so much? Is it cancer or anxiety? I go to the bathroom to visit my ex-girlfriends. There are two lily pads, fire white, one in the bath, the other in the toilet, and they call me Kermit, and they beg Kermit to swim. My body's voices, normally so quarrelsome, grow warm and weepy, and start to sing together, take me to the water. I thought I might sleep in the bathroom tonight. Please don't be mad, wife. I'm not mad at you. I'm mad at the universe unfolding in your body. Can't you think of me as a person? Me seeing the universe in your body is what makes you such a people person. I went to the bathroom to sleep. I dreamt two dreams, one inside the other. The outer dream, a shell. The deeper dream, a yoke. 
In the yoke dream, I was a horse. The dream broke, I awoke, and I saw you driving the dream, charioteer of my sleep. Then the shell dream broke and I woke again, my back stippled with tile, a scar of soap in my ear. Beyond the door, in the realist bed, I find you sleeping. Your breast is like the delicious voice in the telephone. Your bones, when I bite too deep, are the foam's wires full of voice, blue marrow. Um, so this next poem is, uh, I actually, I was looking through my inbox before I came here to try to find like an old poem. Um, so I thought that could be fun. Um, but what I noticed is that so many of the old poems that I found had transformed in some way or another into poems in this book, um, which was kind of an amazing thing to see, like things that have fallen away and things that have grown. Um, and I found this little poem that perfectly explains like the backstory to this next poem, um, which was kind of amazing because I always heard him tell the backstory to the poem, and I, I'd forgotten that he'd ever tried to make the backstory itself a poem, and that was like the first attempt. And then you realize that it actually wasn't this, the backstory, but this sort of thing around it that was like the poem. Um, so this poem is called Poem to My Dog Monday, on night I accidentally ate meat. Um, Max's family always has poodles, um, which I'm not super enthusiastic about, but they really love them. And they had this poodle growing up who, um, his dad, who's this like amazing old Jewish man, I can't do his voice, but he was like, Max, like, this dog is very special. I'm not gonna. <laughs> this, dog, this dog is very special. Like he has to have the most specialist name in the world. Like what's the most specialist thing you can think of? And Max was like, well, all nights, all mornings of the week, I have to wait in bed um, until an appropriate hour. But on Monday mornings, I'm allowed to get up at six and crawl into bed with mommy and watch cartoons. So Monday is the most specialist thing in the world. So they named the dog Monday, and 13 years later, he died of cancer. The dog which is like terrible irony. Um, that Max thought was super funny. So this, <laughs> this, 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 this is called Poem to My Dog Monday on Night I Accidentally Ate Meat. The lights went out on Monday, lying on a green rug, wanting to make noise only. A visitation left in his small white body. The symbol is outrageous, like a hungry man in your soul slamming down jam jars. Thank God for the past tense and its order, and that the dog died before it was symbolic. Monday, the hunt left your bed. It found a white bulb in your body to sleep in. Monday, it's leaving me too. Why does life love flowers most when they are still bulbs? The plant and her roots all stalks, stalking themselves in a circle in the dark. Monday, with your millions of soft horns, I will slip behind your poodle eyes, loading myself like a cartridge of light. I will live in your small, ecstatic brain and take your life, and you can take mine, and we won't give our lives to cancer, but to each other. And thank God for the future where we levitate, or maybe oblivion curls down our ears into wings or figs that he eats. Um, this next poem is called Appeal to My First Love. You can only swallow when I swallow. You swallow every time you see me swallow. The coloring book fills with love over and over. You turn each page over, blotting them red. It's a flip book as stultifying and repetitive as your heart when it adores me. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever laid eyes on. Flip book of sky and love, the flip book of true love. Come back, the cereal is gross, these cartoons are whiny. Adore me to sleep before sleep can adore me on its own terms. Um, some of these poems have recently been published places where they also have recordings of him saying them, and I was going to play one, but I decided it was just too sad. Um, so, but I definitely urge you to check them out. Um, more than the recordings of the voice, there are recordings of him reading, um, which are just like pretty amazing. There's like a whole reading he did of 
um, in New York State at the Hudson Valley Writer Center that was like pretty remarkable. Um, read this poem out loud. It's called The Big Loser. The guardian angel sits in the tree above the black lip of street the man walks down. He calls the man Cargo. The angel sees a pine wood box in the place of a man, and the street he walks is a boat, the hull like a coal crater. Somewhere in the real world there is such a boat and box. The angels call these overlays dreams and believe they crop up because angels can't sleep but want to. Space falls apart when you have unlimited time. The cargo is rattling in the boat. Maybe it's just the waves, maybe it's rats. What's the difference? Either way, it's the box. The angel sends the man a happy vision from his past, the time he fed birthday cake to his goldfish after an unsuccessful party. The angel thinks he's applying lemon oil to the creaky, wounded wood of the box. He knows it's palliative, but it's beautiful. The man reaches the end of the street. He's a sick man, and he starts to ponder death, as he often does these days. All of death is right here. The gods, the dark, a moon. Where was I expecting death to take me if everywhere is on earth? At life's close, you're like the child whose parents step out for a drive. Everyone else out on a trip, but the child remains in the familiar bed feeling old lumps like new in the mattress, the lights off, not sleeping. For who can sleep with the promise of a world beyond the door? That night, the child dreams he's inside the box. It's burning hot, the heat coming from bugs and worms, devouring one another. He starts the hard work of the imagination, learning to minister to the new dream. Perhaps all that's needed is a little rain for everyone to drink and have a bath. Outside, a car humming. Somewhere, his mother singing. Um, some of these poems are, take a little turn for the sad. Um, I think that this book um, really deals with the process of what was going on in these last few years in a really like um, direct way, but without being like cancer poems. Um, I mean, obviously it figures because it's like what his life was doing. Um, but what I really love about it is how he was sort of able to like see through that into this like other kind of thing about life. Um, Max uh, has this sort of quality with the people that he meets where he makes you feel like everything that you say could be like the most important thing that was ever said ever by anyone. Um, my friend Ava recently was describing this and she said to him, um, nothing was trivial, but everything was absurd. Which I think is like the most accurate way of putting it. Um, I watched The Bachelorette with this kid for like years and years and years, um, and it was really important to us. Um, <laughs> and uh, that kind of dedication to watch like so many instances of the same, same, like mindless, soulless thing, but like somehow he was like, this is Commedia dell'arte at its finest. And I was like, yes, that's why I'm watching as well. Um, so, uh, he, so he had this way of sort of like seeing into people this sort of like, um, like the inevitable artist that was in them. Um, and, and so I think that this book really shows that part of him. Um, this book, this poem is called Black Bulls. My mind is three black bulls on three hills of sand, far apart. My loved ones sleep in clay hollows. If I turn from you, you will go back to your clay hollow. The aqueducts of the city of my language clot with lather. The world is bad, and I am bad. Three black bulls on three hills of sand are stretching apart the sheet of my language, crawling with ants. This is the basis upon which we seek company. I am bad. The world is bad.
Three black bulls stomp the hills of sand into blistered glass. Their hooves swelter against these wrong bells. I am so sorry that you have come to this mind of mine. Um, this poem is uh, an incredible anecdote about um, one of the procedures that they did in order to try to figure out a way to, um, like diff different treatments for his cancer. And one of the things that they did was they, um, they gave his cancer to mice, um, which really upset him, um, but that was one of the things that they thought that they could do in order to try to see if they could, um, they could figure out some sort of new method to, to help him. And um, he is a vegetarian and also a Buddhist and was like not super happy about the situation, um, but it created a pretty amazing poem. Um, it's called Poem to My Litter. <laughs> my genes are in mice and not in the banal way that man's old genes are in the beast. My doctor split my tumors up and scattered them into the bones of 12 mice. We give the mites the poisons I might, in the future, want for myself. We watch each mouse like a crystal ball. I wish it was perfect, but sometimes the death we see doesn't happen when we try it again in my body. My tumors are old, older than mice can be. They first grew in my flank a decade ago. Then they went to my lungs and down my femurs and into the hives in my throat that hatch white cells. The mice only have one tumor each in the leg. Their tumors have never grown up, uprooted and moved, learned to sleep in any bed the vast body turns down. Before the tumors can spread, they bust open the legs of the mice who bleed to death. Next time, the doctors plan to cut off the legs in the nick of time so the tumors will spread, but I still have both my legs. To complicate things further, mouse bodies fight off my tumors. We have to give the mice aid so they'll harbor the genes peacefully. I want my mice to be just like me. I don't have any children. I named them all Max. First they were Max 1, Max 2, but now they're all just Max. No playing favorites. They don't know they're named, of course. They're like children you've traumatized and tortured so they won't let you visit. I hope, Max's, some good in you is of me. Even my suffering is good in part. Sure, I swell with rage, fear, the stuff that makes you see your tail as a bar on the cage. But then the feelings pass. And since I do absolutely nothing, my pride, like my fur, all gone, nothing happens to me. And if a whole lot of nothing happens to you, Max's, that's peace, which is what we want. Trust me. Um, cool, cool, cool. I'm just going to read a few more. Um, this one, um, this one's called Afternoon. When I was about to die, my body lit up like when I leave my house without my wallet. What am I missing, I ask, patting my chest pocket. And I am missing everything living that won't come with me into this sunny afternoon. My body lights up for life, like all the wishes being granted in a fountain at the same instant, all the coins burning the fountain dry. And I give my breath to a small bird-shaped pipe in the distance, behind several voices haggling, I hear a sound like heads clinking together, like a game of pool played with people by machines. Um, I'm going to read. I'm going to say one of mine, and then I'm going to read um, one of his. Um, uh, it's kind of like a tender thing to write poems to people especially right after they pass. And I know a lot of people, because he is such an artist, surround him, he surrounds himself with artists and everyone wants to communicate with him in that way. Um, I've been struggling with that a lot. So I'm going to read a poem that I wrote um, last summer, which was when I, I got a call from him. I was like on the road. I was in an Arby's parking lot with a broken down car. And he was like, Sarah, 
it's gone, I'm gonna be fine. And I was like, yes, that's amazing. Um, and I wrote this poem, I started this poem in that news. I was like, everything has changed, everything is different. How is this different for you? Like you've been writing these poems about what it means to be dying for so long. What happens to you now? Like what do you become as a poet? What opportunities do you have and what do you lose? And is that really loss? And um, then things obviously took a turn because things were always going up and down. So the poem sort of resolved itself um, after it was clear that he was going to get he was gonna, he was sick <coughs> again. And um, the poem's called "Not Dying," um, and it just it's interesting to me because it, it had it meant one thing like three months ago, and it means something else now, and I'm kind of interested in that weird contrast. Um, it's called "Not Dying." I had a book of poems I was writing you when you were dying. It was called Eras, a period of time, and also a word in Latin meaning you are, which you were when you were dying, and now even more that you're not. Now that you're not dying anymore, I don't know what to do with these poems, most of which I never wrote because I didn't want you to be dying. In place of words, death filled my mind with a navy gas. When you stopped dying, my center cooled, and down it rained. It hasn't gone from me. It's found a new part to feed. This is how a heart beats. There are two problems with this poem. There's two ways that people can be not dying anymore, no longer dying. Who are you now that you're not dying? What is a good gas? What is a good way to write about someone who is not me and who is dying? These words are the pulse I cut out of my wrist and give to you, and maybe that's medicine. As I keep writing, will you each day keep dying? Is that, in fact, what all poems are? New ways to die, new ways of lying. If you go one day, you will have been more than a period of time. If you go one day, once more, my center will cool and harden into navy ice, and your words will freeze in me, and there will be no room left for other words, and the navy will be dark. Um, and this last one I'm going to read. Thank you guys so much for coming. I know this is like kind of intense, but it means so much to me, um, seriously. And there are books for sale by them if you want. They're amazing um, and really beautiful, and I'm so proud of them. Um, and this is a poem for his wife, Victoria, who, like I said, is this like incredible person. She's a neuroscientist, so they always have like a really interesting, you know, that sort of like art-science relationship that can be tracked through the ages. And um, I'm very, very grateful to know her. So this poem is for her, and it's called Heaven is Us Being a Flower Together. Victoria, I think death comes at blindness. I think pupils are sails, and death is when the wind goes slack. Winter, by being so white, is trying to talk to me. Closing communicated to one who sees death as white worms riddling the apple of the eye. You think death comes at the cessation of touch. You are a flower bulb that can feel even in winter earth. The cold is a line that will not bend, drawn through you foot to head. Heat is a planet fleeing its own cold line. I have written this poem inside of you. I'm clutched in with your mother blood, feeling your bends in the dark becoming a soft bend in your body. We are becoming a bowl in the ground of the living, in the winter of being alive. Thank you guys so much for coming.